House of Squibb presents Academy Award. Every week, Squibb brings you Hollywood's finest. The great picture plays, the great actors and actresses, techniques and skills chosen from the honor roll of those who have won or been nominated for the famous Golden Oscar of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science. And now E.R. Squibb and Sons, manufacturing chemist to the medical profession since 1858, bring you the dramatic picture, The Keys of the Kingdom, which was nominated in five different classifications for the 1945 Academy Award. Our star tonight is the distinguished actor, Gregory Peck. Mr. Peck will play the famous role he created on the screen for The Keys of the Kingdom, and in which he was nominated as Best Actor of the Year for the 1945 Academy Award. <laughs> This is the story of a man who served God in the way in which God wishes to be served, with humility. Of necessity, this is a short story of a long, full life, a vision into the heart of a priest swiftly blurring. In the eyes of God, this man might be a saint. In the eye of the church, memory of his works might not survive his modest epitaph, but in the hearts of some men, there was the certainty that he had received the keys to the kingdom of heaven. On a September evening in 1938, old Father Francis Chisholm welcomed a guest to the parish house of his little church near Tweedside in Scotland. This guest was Monsignor Sleaf, and his visit was occasioned by church business to investigate certain odd irregularities in the administration of Father Chisholm's parish. To the Monsignor, it was a foregone conclusion that this old priest would be removed. Well, Father Chisholm, naturally I don't presume to be your judge. I can only submit my findings to His Grace the Bishop for his consideration in reaching a final decision. And now, if you don't mind, I will go to my room. I shall be leaving the first thing tomorrow morning, and I have still some work to do. Uh, would you be good enough to remind Angus, I, I mean his grace in your report, that, that we were boys together? The bishop has not forgotten that, Father. He spoke of it only last week. Well, we'll mention it to him again, will you? Of course. I, I shouldn't like to leave here if it could be helped. Naturally. Good night, Father. Uh, this is my native parish, you know. Good night. Monsignor Sleeth finished his report early that night, but found himself sleepless. Near his bed was a shelf of books and magazines. To relax, he sought to read, and idly, his hand found a worn leather notebook, a journal of the years of Father Chisholm. Sleep forgotten, he read on through the night. It would be pleasurable to record that I became an immediate success as a priest following my ordination. Alas, the facts were quite otherwise. I failed dismally in my first two curacies. There seemed to be little promise of success in my next, or ever for that matter, when one day there came a summons from the new bishop and my guardian angel of old, Hamish McNabb. Francis, to me you've never been a failure. And I think you never will be. Oh, thank you, sir. But don't ask me why. I'm sure I couldn't say. But I haven't been able to take my eyes off you. And I can't help thinking that you're in the church. Not by chance, but for a reason. I don't want you ever to change. You understand, of course, that I say these nice things to you because 
I want you to do something for me. Well, you've made it impossible for me to say anything but yes, Your Lordship. Francis, the Society for the Propagation of the Faith has asked me to supply a volunteer missionary for China. China? Will you go? Why, I'll be... I'll be happy to go, Your Lordship. I knew you would. And you'll be a credit to both of us. Come to see me again before you leave. We'll pray for you. Oh, oh, wait. It is still raining. Here, take my precious umbrella. Take this with you, lad. It's a good thing to have. You never know when it's going to rain. <laughs> Knowing the greatness and glory of China today, it's difficult as I think back to picture what awaited me upon my arrival. After 10 days and 10 nights up the Taowang River in the province of Chekau, a thousand miles from the sea, I found my mission, the blackened, ruined foundations. There were no converts, nothing but filth, starvation, and enmity. But in time, word of my presence spread, and from the hills came a few of the old converts to help me. Of these, one was a young Chinese boy who walked 18 miles to join me and help me rebuild the mission. His name was Joseph. He was a gift from God, a pillar of strength on whom I leaned. One day, I heard his cart and then his cries for me to come out. Father! Father Chisholm! Father Chisholm, it's for you! It's for you! It arrived on the boat. Well, what is it, Joseph? Medicine. Medicine? Here, let me see what's in that crate. Gauze bandages. Iodine. Castor oil. Is it to rub on, Father? Oh, no, 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 it's to drink. Look at this, a leather case of surgical instruments. Joseph, put that down. Don't drink that castor oil. Not bad. Have some, Father? Uh, no, thank you. No, I'm not thirsty. All these wonderful things. Such a treasure. Surely, Father, an angel in heaven must have sent it. That's just what I was thinking, Joseph. Here's a letter. Your Holiness, it's amazing how religious you can make a man feel by fixing his bellyache. I'm sending you all of my secrets in a book of instructions. Cure what you can and kill what you can't. Signed, Willie Tullock, M.D. and Heathen. P.S. For practicing without a license, I shall, of course, report you to the British Medical Society, the Pope, and my Chinese laundryman, Willie. Father Chisholm, look. We are indeed blessed. The servant of the Mandarin. Uh, please pardon my intrusion. I am here at the bidding of my cousin, the Mandarin, Mr. Chia. You will recall him? Yes, I met him on my arrival. I am to ask whether you will accompany me to his house. And may I ask why? His only son, Chia Yu, lies sick unto death. My cousin asks that you bring with you all your remedies. Well, you must understand that I'm not a trained physician. I, I treat only the most simple disturbances. You said that you came here to do good. Your blessings are for all alike. My cousin asks only that you bring whatever blessings and do whatever good you can. Very well, I'll, I'll go with you. There lies the boy. The lower humors have gained ascendancy and have flowed entirely into one arm, distending it and leaving it blue. You will examine the boy? Yes, I'll need two basins, one of them with boiling water and a cloth. You intend to use the knife? Yes, I must lance the wound. It is most unexpected that Chen Fu would cut with a knife into the flesh of the boy. But there's nothing else to do. His arm is filled with corruption. Unless it's removed, it might spread throughout his whole body. Let us hope that corruption can be removed by cutting and squeezing. Let us hope that everything will be well. <laughs> Father, we are honored this afternoon. Look, it is Mr. Jia, the Mandarin. Well, bid him welcome. Shen Fu, I have come. Mr. Jia, please sit down. Thank you. To speak of first things first, my only son, whose life you saved, is well. He is able to run with his friends. I'm very happy to hear that. I am sorry I have not come to you before, but now I am here. Oh, why are you here, Mr. Jia? Naturally, to become a Christian. Have you come to believe in Christianity? In time, I will no doubt accustom myself to it. You have done the greatest good for me, 
I must do now the greatest good for you. If I become a Christian, all the province will follow my example. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sure you mean well, but you would not be doing good for me, Mr. Cha. You do not believe, nor do you desire to believe. My acceptance of you would be a forgery for God. Do you mean you reject me? I mean precisely that. And please, I do not feel that I wish ever to make any demands upon your gratitude. You owe me nothing. I regret that I am not acceptable. I understand that this is uh, so because I am unworthy. Nevertheless, perhaps there will be some way in which I... Uh, it, uh, it occurs to me to ask, has Shen Fu ever looked or walked upon yonder hill? Yes, often. It's the most beautiful part of the countryside. The property is large in extent, more than 60 fields. It is called the Hill of Brilliant Green Jade. It is mine. I gathered as much. I could not help but notice that the grounds and buildings of your mission are in a disastrous condition. I beg you to honor me by accepting as the property of your church the Hill of Brilliant Green Jade. Mr. Cha. I beg further that you accept the use of 20 of my workmen and the materials to accomplish fully any buildings you may wish to carry out. Mr. Chow, my, my heart is too full to thank you. Before Academy Award continues, let's make a quick change of scene. Picture, if you will, a hot, dry, dusty road, and then imagine stepping off that road into the cool shade of the woods. How quickly refreshment comes. Just as quickly, in a few seconds, cool, fragrant Squib Dental Cream refreshes your mouth. For the very instant Squib Dental Cream touches your tongue, it refreshes with flavor. With the pleasant punch and tang of tender green mint, it wakes up your whole mouth, leaves it tingling. And as you brush, the effective velvet soft polishing agent in Squib Dental Cream helps to bring about a refreshing difference in your smile. That's why millions who use Squib Dental Cream agree you can taste, feel, and see the refreshing difference. So for effective home dental care that's enjoyable too, ask tomorrow for Squib Dental Cream a member of the great family of Squib products. Remember, it's the refreshing dental cream. Before continuing with part two of the Keys of the Kingdom, we want to thank 20th Century Fox for making this story available. Soon to be released is the 20th Century Fox production, Claudia and David, starring Robert Young and Dorothy McGuire. And now the House of Squibb presents part two of Academy Award, starring Gregory Peck in The Keys of the Kingdom. Let's hope that tomorrow will be as nice a day as this, Joseph. The sisters will be here. Selfishly, I imagine that in the years I've been away... I've come to long for the companionship of someone from home. You know, their private terrace needs another batch of bricks. Father can be proud of his workmanship. We can all be proud. This is the work of all of us. This is where the children will learn. Here is the heart of our future. For the future belongs to the children, and our children will belong to God. I shall want the children dressed in their finest and ready at seven in the morning. We must... Joseph! Father, the sisters have come by themselves. Well, Father, one might have supposed some welcome at the end of 6,000 miles of travel. Well, please understand, the letter from Angus, from Monsignor Mealy, I mean, said distinctly that you were to arrive on the 19th. That's tomorrow. Well, Father, I have us shown to our quarters. My two companions are sadly in need of rest. But, Sister, you... Yes, yes, certainly. If you'll follow me, please. Reverend Mother, I, I'd planned, I, I thought perhaps... We could all dine together tonight, by way of a special occasion. Thank you, but I think not. If we could be spared some milk and fruit, after we have rested properly, we shall be fit for work tomorrow. Good afternoon, Father. Mr. 
The years had brought us a fine mission and the blessings of success. They brought other things I should have known were inevitable. War. The Manchu forces of General May in the hills behind us, the Republican forces in the city before us, and the Manchu cannon would spread death and ruin into the city. Almost with the first cannon shot came my dear friend, Dr. William Tullock, all the way from home. It was my place as a priest to help the dying. Dr. Tullock went down into the town with me. We did what we could. The sun's on its way up, and that blasted gun will soon go to bed. Another dawn is here, another night is gone. I've fixed so many wounds, I'm going to write a book called uh, Six Days and Nights in a Chinese Abdomen. Eh? Hey. Oh, I, I must have dozed off for a minute. <laughs> well, I can't see why, seeing you've had no sleep for almost a week. Why don't you leave today's wounded to the army and me? Go on up the hill and get yourself a bath and 400 winks. That would be a pretty sight. The man of God taking his ease, safe from harm. Oh, this is no time to worry about a pill. Father Joseph! Joseph, what are you doing here? The mission. Last night they fired on the mission. How beautiful church, Father. No one was inside, but it is destroyed, eaten by fire. Some of the men were injured when we tried to save the altar pieces. You men, tell the major I'll be back. Come on, Francis. We'll run for it. Keep down, Willie. Crawl, man. In the ditch. All right, I'll crawl, Fancy. <coughs> Willie! Willie! Uh, I'm sorry, Fancy. It seems the time has come to sin for a priest. Almighty God, in your mercy. If you're praying for yourself, Fancy, keep right on. If it's for me, you're wasting your time. On the Almighty's as well. Well, we'll let him be the judge of that, will he? I'm deep in the shadow. And Francie, I still can't believe in God. Are you mad at me? Of course not. Are you disappointed that I won't let you save me? Your salvation would be your doing, Willie, not mine. Well, then, when you get to your kingdom... <laughs> Don't look for my name on the register. It would be fun to meet, just by chance. I've never loved you so much as I do now, Francie. For not trying to bully me into heaven. You see, uh, I have such an awful headache. Give me your heart. Out of the depths, I have cried to thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of supplication. If I could get near the gun, Shen Fu, I would demolish it. But I cannot. There is a way to get near it. For you, Major Shen, and soldiers of your Republican army... I've been ordered to bring food and money to the captain in command of the gun tonight, before midnight. Then, my friend, I must regard you as an undeserved gift from heaven. You understand exactly what is going to occur? Yes. In this sack is cordite. He must get it near the gun. You must be well away before I fire into it, for the concussion will be extreme. Shh, I understand. We're near the gun now. Halt! Oh, it is you! Yes, I've brought a load of tin goods, which I hope will impress you. And I brought money also. Put that sack over there. Give me the money. It's in my purse. I want some assurance that the mission will be unmolested. The mission will not only be un moral, we will occupy it and place it under protection. Particularly... The women. But you gave me your promise. Stop chattering, foreign devil, and give me the money. Shen Fu, run. Save yourself. The sack. Keep him away from the sack near the oh, gun. Oh, no, you don't talk. Run, Mr. Shen. Run, I'll don't fire it. burning torch on it. Run! Am I at the mission? Yes, Father. And the gun. Finished? Yes, Father. It is finished. We are all well and safe. On 
Senior Angus Mealy will be here to visit us in a few days on a tour of inspection. I thought you'd like to know, Reverend Mother, in case there's anything you wish to put before him. I have only one request to make of him. I shall ask to be transferred to another mission. I feel that, that you upset my spiritual beliefs. Why, I, I had no idea. I assure you that you must have misunderstood me. To which specific beliefs do you refer? Do you think I have prepared a list? Your lack of doctrinal discipline. Your general attitude. For instance, when Dr. Tullock was dying. Yes? He was an atheist. And yet you seem to indicate that he might have his eternal reward. He who didn't believe. Well, how could he believe? He never knew God. How could he reject a God he never knew? He was not even a Christian. And how do you define a Christian? One who goes to church one day of seven and prays to be forgiven his sins of the other six. God judges us not only by what we believe, but also by what we do. Willie Tullock died as he lived all the days of his life, fighting the pain and suffering of other men. He was a fine and a sacrificing man. But still, I cannot condone his denial. Well, let's not make his memory the occasion of a quarrel. I wanted you to be happy here. I, I'd looked forward to your coming. But I imagine I am difficult to like, and my ways may be a bit odd. You've worked so magnificently, and the children love you. The mission will suffer terribly when you go, Reverend Mother. Good night. When Senior Mealy came finally... It was a blow to us that he could not celebrate Mass in our beautiful church. He seemed sorely disappointed, too. I cannot see how you're going to rebuild your church, Francis. The society cannot let you have the money. I haven't asked for it. If only you'd been more successful with some of the better-class Chinese, the rich merchants. If only your friend Mr. Cha had seen the light. Well, he hasn't seen it, and he's given most generously. I shall not take another penny from him. Of course, that's your affair. I must tell you frankly that on our chart, I'm sorry to say, your convert rate is the lowest. Well, I suppose missionaries differ in their individual capabilities. Oh, surely no one doubts your capabilities, Francis? It's in the way you do things. Uh, living personally in such poor style. Eating in the kitchen and all that. You ought to impress the natives, make more of a show. The Chinese hate that kind of ostentation. And priests who practice it are regarded as dishonorable. Oh, you refer to their own low heathen priests, I presume. Heathens are not always low, just as Christians are not always high. Many of their priests are good and noble men. Have it your own way, then. Good night, Reverend Mother. Good night, Francis. Father Chisholm, I must tell you something. And it isn't easy for me. I want you to know that I am most bitterly sorry for my conduct. Believe me, no apology was ever more abject than mine. Nor has anyone been less worthy of forgiveness. You needn't, please, I... Please, please. Easier for me to speak now. How strange that this moment of my greatest humiliation should bring with it the only peace I've ever really known. Tonight, I intended to ask Monsignor Mealy to send me away. But as I sat in this kitchen, as I heard him humiliate you and slight you, as I felt the magnificence of your faith and the courage in your heart, as I saw you reflect the worldliness of this priest who was unfit to tie your shoes, Have pity, Father. Forgive me. Pity me. Well, there, there's nothing for which I have to forgive you. I'm glad you no longer dislike me. You know, we're both children to God. And with his help, we'll work and mature. Enough at any rate for me to know that I'd grown old in my exile. 
I was reminded of this everywhere I looked. Joseph, for instance, with three sons as old almost as he was, in that dark hour when he first came to me. Mother Maria Veronica, my friend, all the others. Even the trees, gnarled and ancient, as the ivy on the walls. The time had come for me to go home. Good morning, Father. Oh, good morning, Monsignor. I... Hope you slept well. As a matter of fact, I didn't sleep at all. Your journal was on the bookshelf by my bed, and I must confess that I spent the night in reading it. I hope you don't mind. Oh, not at all. If anything, I'm flattered. I, I would have imagined that memories of a life as ineffectual as mine would guarantee sleep. Ineffectual? It is an honor to know you, Father. Uh, goodbye, Monsignor. Uh, you won't forget to mention to Angus, I mean to his there grace... There is nothing I will say to the bishop that will in any way alter your position here or your hopes for the future. Why, thank you. Thank you, Father Chisholm. <laughs> Tonight, Academy Award has a guest of honor, Erskine Johnson, syndicated columnist and Hollywood correspondent of Motion Picture Magazine. He is here on a very special occasion, the 35th anniversary of Motion Picture Magazine, 35 years of covering Hollywood, its pictures and stars. Mr. Johnson. Thank you. I am proud to speak for Mr. Maxwell Hamilton, our editor, as well as myself. Motion Picture Magazine is intensely interested in Academy Award creating a radio program out of the greatest achievements of motion pictures, presenting every week the greatest stars and pictures of all time, is a treat for the public and a stimulus to the motion picture industry. I congratulate you all. And now I am pleased to present you with this citation. Motion Picture Magazine, on its 35th anniversary, salutes E.R. Squibb & Sons Academy Award as the outstanding radio program featuring motion picture stories and talent. Through your cooperation with the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in broadcasting only the best, you are making a great contribution to the advancement of the art of motion pictures. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. For nearly a century, the House of Squibb has maintained a quest for perfection in serving the profession of medicine. In the field of human health, it has ever believed that nothing less than the best could be justified. Squibb has approached radio broadcasting with the same aspiration to the highest standards and is grateful at this recognition by Motion Picture Magazine of its endeavor to give the radio public top-ranking dramatic art. Next Wednesday, another great picture. The House of Squibb will present Academy Award starring Jimmy Stewart in One Sunday Afternoon. Gregory Peck is soon to be seen in David O. Selznick's Technicolor production, Duel in the Sun. This is Hugh Brundage bidding you good night until next Wednesday at the same time when you're invited to listen again to Academy Award, presented by the House of Squibb, a name you can trust. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>